I'm Batman. I'm part of the Modulicious uh, core team. Uh, I'm here to represent the Modula written, uh, which allows you to to uh, write tests that runs inside your browser. So, who here uses Modulicious? Does anyone use uh, Test Mojo? Okay, right. So some of this will be familiar, and I will try to link uh, my module into the test mojo module so you can see some of the similarities. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, why would you write tests? Why would you write tests that run, uh, runs in your browser? Uh, the first thing that comes into mind is uh, maybe you have some JavaScript uh, that you want to check if uh, the on-click event handler or something like that works. Uh, but another thing is that if you're writing um, uh, web pages that um, changes how it looks on a mobile phone or on a desktop, you might want to test that as well. If you have any other use cases, then please let me know so I can tell other people about it. Um, yeah, so the module is called uh, Test Mojo Row Selenium. Um, and under the hood, it uses a module called Selenium Remote Driver. Um, and that module allows you to, to uh, run your test in the Internet Explorer, Firefox, or Chromium, or actually any other uh, um, browser that supports the Selenium. Uh, which has a Selenium driver. Um, yeah, um, that distribution also comes with some test libraries, uh, but I wanted to write uh, a new um, library that simulates uh, how test mojo works because I think the API is really nice to work with. Um, this whole presentation is going to be um, me running scripts and going through code. So if you have any questions while I do that, please just interrupt me and ask what is going on. Um, If you want to use this module, you need to have some kind of browser or some driver that talks to your browser. So this is on OS X. You can install, for example, Chrome driver. But I suspect you can do the same thing on Linux and maybe Windows as well. I'm not quite sure. But there's also some online services that allows you to run your test through all kinds of different browsers. So it doesn't really matter as long as your service uh, speaks a Selenium driver. <clears throat> um, the Gecko driver for Firefox, uh, I wasn't able to actually use that because it seems to be under heavy development. But um, uh, yeah, and I think you need to do some tweaking if you want to if you want to run the tests in Firefox. Okay. So this whole presentation is linked to um, under the schedule. So you can either follow this or, or run all the scripts uh, afterwards, if you like. So this is kind of my cheat sheet. Can everybody read that? Is it big enough? OK. <clears throat> um, so this is just a regular test file, but it uses uh, the uh, test mojo role selenium, uh, which you load in with, with this line. And then afterwards, you can set some environment variables to instruct how it works. By default, it's going to use Phantom, but if you want to use some other browser, you can just set this environment var variable. You can also do this programmatically uh, through the API, but uh, I, um, I implemented through uh, environment variables as well. So if you have a CI or something, you can just set up the environments inside the config files. Um, this next line here, 
uh, creates a new test object. Um, this module setup or skip all will try to initialize the driver and try to connect to, to uh, whatever web browser that you're running. So this means that if, if it's not enabled or if it's unable to do that, it will just skip the whole test seat. So that means that you can just drop in all of these uh, Selenium test files in your regular uh, test directory. And if you um, have some automated tests that doesn't have any Selenium or web browsers, it will just skip all of those tests uh, automatically. Um, this next line uh, will simply set the window size. So let's say if you want to test, uh, run some tests on um, something that emulates a, a mobile screen, you can just figure out what, what is, for example, the resolution on an iPhone, and you can set the window size here, and it will act as it was on a smaller screen. Uh, the next method, navigate OK, will uh, open up the web browser and it will go to that location. Um, this can be a full URL or it can be a relative URL. Um, if you put in a full URL, it will actually go to whatever web page. So if you want to test Google or Facebook or whatever, you can, you can use this module for that as well. Um, uh, yeah, then it's going to uh, uh, either check against um, a base URL that you can specify, which I'm going to use in this demo, or it's going to check uh, against the modulicious application that you loaded inside your test suite. But for this uh, test, it's going to uh, go online. So hopefully the Wi-Fi is going to work. <laughs> And it's going to browse around on the modulicious web page, and it's going to click. So that's why here, when I construct a new uh, object, I'm not specifying any, any application. OK, there's a bunch of other uh, methods here uh, where you can check that the URL is actually what you expect it to be. And then there are some similarities to the test mojo uh, module, where you have uh, Text is, that's the test mojo method. But if you want to check what is this text actually displayed as inside the browser instead, then you can prefix most of the methods with live underscore instead. So that means that you can both test the server side uh, text and also the, the text that is inside the browser. Um, this um, uh, object has a driver attribute which is the um, remote driver object. So you can actually call any, any method that that module provides. So here I'm going to uh, do execute script, which runs a JavaScript snippet inside your browser. And what I'm doing here is just removing uh, the target attribute from the form, because uh, on the modulicious website, it's going to open up a new window. And I don't want this. I want it to be running in the same window. Um, here is another method that is uh, for, this mod, um, for this module. Element is displayed. That means that you can check if uh, an element is visible or if it's hidden. I mean, if you want to check if it's hidden, then you need to use element is hidden instead. So by using these methods, you can, for example, check that if you're on a cell phone, you can see if the, if the menu is uh, collapsed into some home hamburger button or something like that. After that, we're going to send some uh, keys, like pressing the keyboard, keyboard uh, into an, an input. So here, we're typing the string uh, render. And then afterwards, we're hitting return. So everything that has a reference with a slash in front, that's going to be a control character instead of the actual keys. So this will simulate pressing render and then hitting return on the keyboard. After that, there's a helper method called wait until, which will just um, periodically check if the browser has some state changed. So here it's going to check if get uh, if the get current URL method um, is changed into a new URL, because originally it's it says slash Perl doc, 
but that, then later, since we're doing a, a submitting a form, we want to check that the query paramet parameter is part of the URL. So this is instead of, for example, doing sleep two seconds, <coughs> which could be a, a pretty bad uh, thing to do if, if the network is lazy or uh, slow or something. Well, using the wait until, you will actually just sit there and wait and wait and until the, the state is changed. And then on the next page, we check if uh, the input field has the, the render value that we entered on the previous page. OK, so. Here you can see that uh, I set up a test selenium environment variable that has a base URL. That means that instead of checking against the, the local application that you may, may or may not load inside your test file, it's going to do, go to that web page and then uh, use that URL as the base for all of the relative URLs. So this means that when the test says, um, uh, go to slash product, it's going to end up as http colon slash slash modulicious.org slash product. So let's see if this works. OK, this runs quite fast, <laughs> but at least it, it's successful. Mm. What we can do is that we can uh, uh, add some uh, kind of doing sleep so we can actually see what the demo is doing. Okay, so now it's opened up the uh, web browser and it's resized it as we wanted. And then it went to the slash product as we instructed. And I was just sitting there waiting for five seconds. Then it's supposed to enter render into the uh, input. I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, but then on the last page here, you see that the, this input field actually has render that we wanted. And that's what the test is checking. So um, the tap output here has uh, pretty much what we, uh, what we wanted. It navigates, and then it checks for the URL, and it checks for uh, the different selectors, and that thing is displayed and stuff like that. Um, since this is a, a test mojo, since it's built on top of test mojo, and then there's a TX attribute. I'm not sure if anyone has used that. But the TX attribute on test mojo is what contains the transaction object that is used when you, uh, when you created a request and when you got the response back. But since this is on a live web page, you can't really see that. Uh, you, you don't really have that object because all the headers and all the, uh, the body and stuff like that is just inside the browser. So I can't extract that. So that's just what this message is, uh, is telling you. Okay. Does anyone have any other further questions to that? So the, the thing about this test is just showing you that instead of just running it against your local application, which you normally do with Test Mojo, you can run it against an external web page. So the idea here is that, uh, let's say if you have a complex setup with uh, uh, reverse proxies and load balancers and stuff like that, then there might be a bug in production that you don't spot uh, inside your test suite. So then you can uh, fire up the same uh, tests and run it against your live platform and see if it actually follows through the way you expect it to go. This uh, next example will uh, run against uh, Modulicious Lite um, application. I'm sure. Uh, do most people like how many people use uh, full apps like uh, with controller classes and stuff like that? 
And how many has written a light application? Okay. Um, the light application just has a bunch of keywords uh, that allows you to define routes and, and the actions inside one big file. And since I'm defining this application inside my test file, I can again call new without any arguments since it's just in, inside the same, or since it's a light app. But this will actually construct a new test module uh, uh, object uh, where the tests will go against that application. But if you have uh, if you have this application instead, then it's going to load in that full app, and then you, you can run all the tests against that. It's just like regular test mojo. That's only going to use it if the uh, that app is installed properly and not in a worker folder, or not in a different folder. That depends on how you run prove. So if you do the L. Uh, if you use the L switch, then it's going to uh, look inside your uh, lib directory. Okay, so Selenium, uh, with Selenium you can do uh, screenshots. So by default, um, the module is going to uh, generate uh, screenshot file names and put it into your temp systems temp directory. But if you want to store it somewhere else, you can just specify the screenshot directory and it's going to put all the screenshots there. And that could be really useful if you're running headless, where you don't actually see the browser window. You just have tests running like I don't know every before every time you de deploy. So if a test fails, you can actually look at the screenshots and see how how the web page was, uh, how, how it looked when the test was failing. Um, in the light app, we define a route uh, slash home. It could be anything, but then we navigate to slash home. So we don't need to specify the whole URL here. You just say the relative part, and it's going to figure out which um, host name and which port your uh, test modulicious app is running on. Uh, the next thing here, you can see that uh, now that you're running against a, a local application, um, you can do all of the things that Test Mojo can do. So what is happening here is that before the request is sent to uh, to the web uh, to the web server and back to the web browser, uh, it's captured. So it creates a TX object, so you can see uh, all of the stuff that actually goes over the wire. So then you can do things like <coughs> calling headers. Um, so you can mix both your regular server-side uh, tests and the in-browser tests. Um, here we do a screenshot, and then we do text like and live text is. You could also do live text like here if you like instead. So these two methods are pretty much the same thing. The only thing is that one of them checks how it's represented inside the browser, and the other thing is uh, checking how uh, the actual HTML looks like when you pass it over. So let's say if you do text-like, and then you have some JavaScript that modifies the text inside of your browser, then live text-like might be doing something, uh, or it might fail because it's been changed on the client side. Okay. Um, the rest of this is pretty much the same thing as we we did in the previous test. We fill in some data in, inside the form, and then we go to and then we submit the form, and then we check how it looks. So here is the template that's going to be loaded inside the inside the browser, and here we see that we have a heading. Um, so hopefully that test is okay. So this is going to check if modulicious application is inside H1. And then we have a form uh, with an input field uh, that we're going to enter text into, and then we're going to submit it. OK, so running this test without uh, the test selenium uh, environment variable set up, 
uh, will automatically just skip everything. So this is just for, um, uh, again, if you're mixing your regular tests and your Selenium tests, then you might not want to run your Selenium tests in a, in an automatic test, test run. So let's set that variable. Ooh. <laughs> um, so what happens here is that we didn't set, set up which browser uh, it's going to use. So the default is using Phantom. Um, probably going to change that later to using headless Chrome instead. Um, but uh, running Phantom is a lot quicker if you don't need uh, to actually visually see what's going on. But uh, you can change that using the envir environment variable, or you can just set it from uh, inside your application or inside your test. So. So, whoops. If you set this environment uh, from the command line, then it's going to use that browser instead. So, if you want to use Firefox, then just change to Gecko or whatever. Um, here we can see that it generated some screenshots. So, here's the first screenshot. It just shows you that there's a blue web page and there's nothing filled in. And then after we fill in yikes inside the, uh, inside the um, form input, and then we take another screenshot and then we submit the, the, the form. So this can be useful if you, if you uh, change your CSS and you want to verify that the web page is still white instead of red or whatever. We're really not sure why the test isn't okay. <laughs> you got a closing, the wrong closing type for the header. Ah. I thought that one's whether it was intentional. Right. Okay. I didn't want to sign anything in case it's spoiling. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Oh, it's still. Doesn't look much like a regex. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. So here you see that the the um, let's see, I can show you the when you just do capture screenshot, it will automatically generate a file name, but you can specify the file name if you like. But the file name looks like the name of the unit test, and then there's a timestamp, and then there's a sequence of, of which, screenshot, uh, which screenshot you made. So there won't be any conflicts here. So then you can just browse through all of the screenshots that the, the, that the test generated. Mm. Right. Anyone have any comments or questions about that? How, how tight to merge initials is it? Is it perfectly suitable for using in, in any um, Yeah, so you can uh, you can run it against any live web page. It doesn't care what kind of if it's ISS or uh, IIS or if it's whatever. Uh, and also, uh, you can use the, um, the PSGI role, um, and then you can pretty much, I guess you can pretty much run it against any of the, of the Pro Web frameworks. And if you do that, what's going to happen with the rest of the test module stuff that is actually like, that lets you dig into the module app? What yeah. you call that? Is it going to break apart? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I haven't tested that, so uh, I'm not quite sure. But uh, there's a... Um, um, mm, 
there's a helper method here that you can use that says if tx. So then you can put all your uh, specific modulus tests inside that block. So that way, you uh, let's say if you run it against a, a live server instead of your uh, local modulus application, then it's just going to skip that whole that whole uh, uh, code block here. But um, yeah, it might work, but I'm I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, Okay, here's another example. <laughs> uh, this does the same thing, but it, it has a different use case. So if we look at the actual HTML, we can see that uh, there's two divs here, and one has the show on mo mobile class, and the other one has a show on desktop class. So the way you can, and then it has some CSS, that uh, uh, where you specify different breakpoints, it's going to show or hide the different elements on the web page. So the way we can test this is that first, we set some window size that is some random cell phone. You can, of course, specify whatever you like. Uh, but uh, the test here is supposed to say that uh, the show on mobile element is actually displayed while the uh, show on desktop element is hidden. And then inside the same test, uh, without changing the URL or anything, we just change the window size, and then it's supposed to switch around. So then you can see that the show on mobile is hidden because uh, you're now on desktop, and the show on desktop element is, is uh, displayed. And then just to be sure, in case something breaks, uh, I do capture screenshots um, at the end of both of these tests. And then just for the sake of the demo, I have some wait for. Um, I'm calling wait for here. OK, right. I could tell you a little bit about wait for, is that if you give it a, if you give it a number, it's going to wait for that many seconds. But the reason why you want to use wait for instead of just writing sleep is because wait for is going to keep the mojo IO loop running. And that's uh, important in case, uh, let's say, if you have a single page application that uses a WebSocket or something like that, you need to be able to, to keep running the IO loop so it's going to exchange data with the server. So, if, But if you just do sleep 5 instead of wait for 5, then it's going to block the whole process and the web browser is going to freeze up as well. Okay. Waiting for five seconds. Right. Would it be a problem to set the window size uh, bigger than the actual size of the desktop? Yes. We could try. <laughs> um. Yeah, at least if you're running headless, then it should at least not be a problem because then you don't show it on any desktop or anything. So it looks pretty wide, so <laughs> I think it works. So if you use a real browser, it will also store password, right? So that makes it much easier to test things that require logging in. Well, the thing is that it's going to open up a completely uh, anonymous browser. So it's not incognito mode, it's just a completely different uh, temporary profile. So if you have stored your passwords, then it, it's not going to use that. Standard Selenium, you can choose a profile if you want. If you've got an extra profile for testing, debugging, whatever, you can have uh, um, modules installed in Firefox or whatever, and you can also have your profile with passwords. Okay. Yeah. Could be very useful. Yeah. yeah. 
you might be able to specify it from when you construct the, the Selenium uh, driver object as well, but I haven't checked into that if you're using the Gecko driver or the Chromium driver. But uh, will, will it also support if I, if I run several chests at the same time? Uh, I tried doing it uh, with the Chromium driver and it didn't work. Ah. But uh, maybe it will work if you use uh, if you use a headless driver instead. I actually have no idea. It might be in my test suit that it's broken instead of the actual selenium uh, part. So I would just try it out and see what happens. It might work if you choose a different port for the communication with selenium. Yeah, when when you create a new selenium driver object, it's going to do an incremental. Okay. So it's going to choose a new port. Mm. But I'm not sure how far it goes. Maybe just maybe 16 in parallel. But we could try that as well. Right. So that doesn't work very well. I'm not sure uh, if anyone wants to dig into it. I would. Love to know if it's my fault or if it's the Selenium driver's fault. Um, yeah, I really don't know. Okay. So this next part, uh, I'm going to show you some like. The other thing was just some dummy examples, uh, which is pretty much the same thing that is inside the synopsis. Uh, but these two uh, new tests, um, I'm going to show where I use this in a real application. This application is Conmos. Uh, me and Marcus has written a chat application that allows you to uh, be on IRC for your web browser. And it's a single page application. So there's like 50% JavaScript and there's 50% Perl. So we wanted to test the JavaScript part as well. Um, so this test is um, it's just checking a, a JavaScript um, a JavaScript class, the URL. And it's going to check if it's actually able to parse and generate the correct URLs. So I can't remember all the different uh, test libraries for JavaScript, but like Mocha or any of the others, you could just run this directly. But since I want to uh, run it through the Perl test suite, then I've written a Selenium uh, test for it instead. But it's kind of overkill because it's just going to check if, if that um, if those objects uh, behave the correct way. So when you do execute script, you can see that you have return new URL there, and then it's going to try the best it can to make that uh, return value into a Perl data structure. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to behave with functions and stuff like that, but at least anything that looks like JSON is going to be able to, to turn that into um, data structure so we can do uh, use the normal test more tests and use like like or is deeply so here you can do whatever you like in JavaScript space and then uh, run the tests in Perl so here there's just a bunch of different tests that try to create uh, different kinds of URLs so most of these URLs are just copy-pasted from the Mojo test suite um, to see if, if uh, my library is going to handle them the same way. Um, okay, so here you can see that it uh, makes an initial request, and then since it's inside the browser, it's going to get all of the scripts and all the all the JavaScript and all the CSS as well. So there's a bunch of GET requests here that goes into your 
application that is started up inside the uh, unit test. Um, so here we can see that we load in the URL.js library. And then there's a bunch of requests. <laughs> and then it starts navigating to the correct uh, web page. And then we, uh, we run some um, uh, uh, later, we would just run the JavaScript snippet. And then uh, here, since it's just normal like and is and is deeply uh, functions, it's not going to show you any extra uh, debug information. It's just regular Perl unit test. So. Um, this test is a little bit more complicated. What it's going to do is uh, try to go to the registration form, fill out the registration form, and see that you actually get connected to an IRC server at the end. So since it's a single uh, page application, then I'm using a lot of wait for here. So as you saw earlier, you could specify a number, which would be pretty much like sleep. But all of these wait for, it's going to wait for an element instead. So here, it, uh, the, the test is going to hang here until it finds an element that matches that CSS selector. And you have some modifiers at the end where you can see column displayed or hidden. So then it's going to wait until the browser uh, hides or shows a, a, a certain element. Here you see that uh, you have another method which is called click on. And that takes another CSS uh, expression and it's going to find that button or link and it's going to click on it. And then uh, instead of waiting for a URL to change, we're just going to check if, if uh, another element uh, is displayed on the, on the page. And then we send a bunch of keys into the different uh, form elements. And then we do wait for again. <laughs> Instead of doing like sleep one, uh, you actually wait for element, which is a lot more robust. And that's pretty much uh, just repeated down through the whole test that you go through different kinds of steps. So, I'm not sure if you could see this error message, but it said that it couldn't connect. So let's say, uh, since it's actually connected to a real IRC server, then it's much more robust to, to do the wait for instead of uh, waiting X seconds. OK. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty much how I write all the tests. Click on something, wait for an element, send some keys, wait for another URL, wait for some change, and then see what happens. I think that's uh, pretty much it. Okay. The Link to the module is inside the presentation URL that you find inside the description of the presentation that you just attended. So if you have any questions about the module, just ask me or send me an email or contact me on RC. You said there was some problem with uh, Firefox? Yeah. Driver, what was that? Uh, it seems like after version 36 or something, it stopped working. So because they, the, the Gecko driver, is, uh, it seems like they're changing a lot of the internals. But, but what you can do instead, if, if you actually have a Selenium server, then you can run Firefox through that instead. And that seems to work. So uh, but it's just the, the actual Gecko driver executable that is changing. Yeah. One recommendation would be to set the Firefox to use the extended stability release, so you don't have uh, every you release, they, uh, they visit it out. So there is a gap between the Firefox and the Gecko version. 
Server, you need some kind of headless that is executable, like Chromium headless or Selenium or something. And I haven't set that up myself because I'm just running it locally on, on my laptop while I'm developing. Uh, but uh, hopefully, Marcus is he's my co worker, so hopefully, he will figure it out during the next week. Uh, but there's also different kinds of online services that allows you to talk Selenium with those services. And that might be the direction that we're heading in because then we can run IE 8, 9, 10, 11 and just run the test suite over a bunch of different web browsers. So, but I haven't really set up uh, uh, automatic tests from myself. And probably go to the X because uh, it's able to run the browser. Oh. Yes. Who wants to order him in front of Let's see. Um, uh, these are the one uh, I, I know about. So the thing is that instead of, because I didn't want to install Java, <laughs> that's why I'm using the Chrome driver instead. And you need Java if you want to install if you, if you want to run Selenium, then you install Java Runtime 8 or something. But uh, these, uh, the underlying module can talk with those uh, drivers as well. So, but there's some limitations to the different ones. Uh, and I think the, the way they are changing the Gecko driver now, there's a bunch of things that I can, uh, couldn't get it into doing. Uh, but the Phantom JS and the phone driver seems to work pretty well, at least for me. Except that Phantom JS is. Uh, uh, it's going away, so. Okay, 